Today, I'm going to do something a little different with the passage. We got the whole fifth chapter of Daniel, but I'm not going to read it all at once. We're going to take it in different places. Now, if you're like me and you're sitting out there, you'll read the whole chapter while we're up here. That uh, I'm just that guy. You know, I have to read the whole thing. That is just fine. But we're going to pick certain verses out of the chapter and go back um, just for the sake of organization and stuff today. Um, it's Memorial Day weekend, right? It's a day when we remember those who have died to protect our country. It's important that we honor people in events from the past uh, to help us remember those events. Memorial Day is an official holiday in most states in the United States. It was observed on May 30th until 1971 when, for federal employees, the date was changed to the last Monday of the month of May. With the exception of Louisiana, all states observing Memorial Day adopted that change. They still do it on the 30th. It's also known as Decoration Day. The custom of placing flowers on the graves of the war dead began on May 5th, uh, 19, or 1866 in Waterloo, New York, and that place has been recognized as the official uh, birthplace of Memorial Day. Uh, in 1868, General John A. Logan, who was president of the Grand Army of the Republic, declared that May 30th would be a day to decorate with flowers the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion. After World War I, that day was set aside to honor all of the American wars, and the dead from those wars, and the custom was extended to pay homage, homage not only to those that died, but also to the deceased relatives and friends, both military and civilian. The most solemn ceremony conducted on Memorial Day is the placing excuse me, of a wreath at the tomb of the unknown soldier located in Arlington National Cemetery. Tomorrow we'll celebrate that day. Many people see it as just a day off. A three-day weekend. But for those who have lost someone because of war or military action, it means much more than a day off. In fact, every American ought to recognize that day uh, as part of their patriotic duty to their country and in honor of those who spilled their blood to make America what she is today. Free, strong, and a nation worth fighting for. Because men and women have died for this country, we have the right to preach God's word freely. We have the right to live at peace in our homes. We have the right to pursue peace, prosperity, and happiness. Thank God for those who died to make us free. But why do we acknowledge that day in church? Not because we're worshiping our government. Not because we equate America with being Christians. Not because we're a nationalist church, but because we are Christians who are Americans. And we're grateful that we live in a country where we are free to worship Christ, where we are free to tell others about what a difference He has made in our lives, and where people are free to accept the claims of the gospel without the pressure of government or the restriction of government. That said... I think the biggest battle that we as Americans are facing today is a battle for the very soul of our nation. We see it all around us every day. The erosion of our society has been a slow process, but we've seen it accelerate rapidly, I think, in the last few years. It really doesn't matter whether there's a Democrat or a Republican sitting in the Oval Office. This nation that we've all come to know and love continues to erode. The position that we're in today is because of what we tolerated yesterday. And the position that we'll be in tomorrow will be because of what we tolerate today. History has a way of repeating itself. In Daniel's day, he saw a lot of what we're seeing today. His situation was much worse. The fifth chapter of Daniel describes the collapse of a culture. They were comfortable and they were secure within the confines of their strong walls, but they crumbled from within. And the way I see it, Babylon made four huge mistakes. They lost all sense of remembrance. They lost all sense of reality. 
They lost all sense of restraint, and they lost all sense of respect. And on this Memorial Day, my prayer is that we would be challenged to be a people of repentance and that we would acknowledge that anything that we do is vanity without the presence of the Holy Spirit. The danger of losing all sense of remembrance is dealt with in verses 18 through 23. Let's look at that. This is Daniel speaking. And he's talking to Belshazzar. He says, Your Majesty... The Most High God gave sovereignty, majesty, glory, and honor to your predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar. He made him so great that people of all races and nations and languages trembled before him in fear. He killed those he wanted to kill, and he spared those he wanted to spare. He honored those he wanted to honor, and he disgraced those that he wanted to disgrace. But when his heart and his mind were puffed up with arrogance, he was brought down from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven from human society. He was given the mind of a wild animal, and he lived among the wild donkeys. He ate grass like a cow, and he was drenched with the dew of heaven until he learned that the Most High God rules over the kingdoms of the world and appoints anyone he desires to rule over them. You are his successor, O Belshazzar, and you knew all this, and yet you have not humbled yourself. For you have proudly defied the Lord of heaven and have had these cups from his temple brought before you. You and your nobles and your wives and your concubines have been drinking wine from them while praising gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Gods that neither see nor hear nor know anything at all. But you have not honored the God who gives you the breath of life and controls your destiny. Belshazzar's problem was the same many people have today. He had forgotten some valuable lessons from the past. Things that his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, had learned the hard way. Things like uh, in Daniel 4.37, where Nebuchadnezzar says, and all his acts are just and true, and he is able to humble the proud. In most cases, pride comes before destruction. Daniel gives us an important insight when he challenges the king with the accusation that you have proudly defied the Lord of heaven. That's what Belshazzar was doing, boasting about himself. He picked up right where King Nebuchadnezzar had left off saying, Nebuchadnezzar had looked out over this massive city that, and this, the nations that he had conquered, and he says, look at this great city of Babylon. By my own mighty power, I've built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. God informs them that he did not do that on his own. Pride leads to a fall. It's right up there at the top of the list of things that God despises. If you don't want to take my word for it, just ask Satan. Ask Adam and Eve. Ask King David, ask Simon Peter. Yes, God is able to humble the proud. In fact, the scriptures tell us that God opposes the proud. So God is not mildly annoyed by your pride. He considers your pride to be idolatry because that means you are worshiping yourself. You have set yourself up. It's right there in the middle of the word pride, the big eye. You have set yourself up as the God of your universe. And when you set yourself up as God, now you are in opposition to God because He is the only God. And He opposes that. And you begin to find in your life difficult times popping up over and over and over again to prove to you that you are not in control, to prove to you that you are not the God of the universe. Because there's only one God. America used to honor God unashamedly and openly. Now, don't be under the illusion that at any time in America was everybody a Christian. People talk about America being a Christian nation. It was never a theocracy. And not everybody here was honorable. Not everybody here was a Christian. But it was founded on Christian principles. It's etched in numerous monuments all over the nation's capital. It's carved in granite on many of the government buildings that we hold dear. It's printed on our currency. 
There was a time when we credited God with our blessings and our successes, and we turned to Him in our trials and our losses. But today, like Babylon, we seem to have lost a sense of remembrance. President Woodrow Wilson said it best. He said, a nation that does not remember what it was yesterday does not know what it is today or what it is trying to do. We are about a futile thing if we do not know where we came from or what we have been about. In many ways, we've forgotten our past. What was it about America that made us so great and caused men and women from all nations around the world to risk their lives and fortunes to come here? Is there something about America that distinguishes us from our neighbors to the north and south? Canada was settled by French explorers who were looking for gold. Mexico was saddled by Spanish explorers who were also looking for gold. America was settled by men and women who came here primarily looking for God. They came searching for a home where God could be exalted and worshipped in spirit, freedom, and truth. We've fallen a long way from where we once were. We've gotten so far off our founder's path that it's not uncommon to see the federal courts repeatedly doing things such as restricting manger scenes from from city squares and removing Ten Commandment displays from government buildings. And can I tell you, that's annoying. But if all we got is a public display, we don't got much. The government cannot restrict your godly life. And having a big fight about a poster in City Hall will not do much for the sake of the gospel. But the way that you conduct yourself and the way that you treat people will have a huge impact on the gospel. But unfortunately, there's some sobering similarities between ancient Babylon and modern-day America. And just like Babylon, there's an expensive price to pay when a nation loses all sense of remembrance of who they are and where they come from. There's also a danger of losing all sense of reality. We see that in Belshazzar in the first verse of the chapter. Many years later, talking about after Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar finally died. Um, Belshazzar's dad was in there briefly, and then Belshazzar is king. So this is about 20 years after Nebuchadnezzar. Many years later, King Belshazzar gave a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he drank wine with them. So in order to understand how that king had lost all sense of reality, you need to know that just outside the city walls of Babylon at that moment was a massive army of the Medes and the Persians. They had defeated the Babylonians in an important battle, and they surrounded this city. So this feast does not take place just like, hey, you guys want to come over for a party? It's a bad situation. The the Babylonians thought that because of their history of dominance and their strong walls, that they were invincible and indestructible. Now, those walls stretched for a circumference of, of 60 miles. Big city. But everywhere you look beyond them, you could see the enemy surrounding the city. No problem, they thought. After all, the walls are so high and so thick, it's impossible for them to get in. And we've got a 20 year supply of rations inside, so we're good. So what does Belshazzar do? He loses all sense of reality, throws a big party, invites a thousand guests. That's just the guys. It doesn't include all the other people that were there. He has this party and destructions at his door. When we begin to feel secure in our own strength, danger is just outside our door. Many people today think that just because they got away with something before, they'll get away with it again. And this king was too blind and too drunk on his own success to realize that the strength of a kingdom or of an individual is never on the outside, but it's on the inside. And Babylon soon fell because they had become corrupt on the inside with no more sense of remembrance or reality. Some people today foolishly think that somehow God needs America to carry out his plan on the earth. After all, we've won all the world wars, right? We've always been on the winning side. We seem to be the only real superpower still standing in the world today, but 
1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, If you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. And like those in ancient Babylon, we too sometimes think we're invincible. And I think now, more than ever, it's time for us to remember who we are, where we've come from. And I think it's time for us to look at the reality of what's going on around us and truly pray, God, forgive us. There's a danger in losing all sense of remembrance, of all sense of reality. There's a danger in losing all sense of restraint. Daniel 5, 2. While Belshazzar was drinking the wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver cups that his predecessor Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. He wanted to drink from them with his nobles, his wives, and his concubines. When a nation or an individual loses all sense of remembrance, reality, they also lose a sense of restraint. The Babylonians were too blind to see any connection between moral decay and national decline. Does that sound familiar? Now, concubines here were women who were kept for the king's pleasures and for additional procreation. Our, our nation, like Babylon, is virtually given over to sexual permissiveness and perversions of all types. You see that in our country, right? You can sleep with whoever you want to. Marriage is an option. The sin that we were once ashamed of, we shout from the rooftops now. There's no right or wrong, just your own preferences and your own urges. And like the Babylonians, we've lost all sense of restraint. Belshazzar wasn't just content with drinking, getting drunk, sleeping around, having a big party. He decided he needed to do this with the gold cups and things that had been taken from the Lord's temple. So he spit in the face of God. The things that were holy, it's just a cup. We look at things and go, that's not holy. We don't care if the Bible says this. We don't care. We're going to do what we want to do anyway. We're doing the same thing. Holy schmoly. I had to explain to Amy that when you're making fun of something, you just say it again, but you put sh in front of it. And I said something this week, and she's like, what? I'm like, you say it once the real way, and then and you put sh in front of it. So we look at holiness, and we go, schmoliness, right? We don't care about that. When that happens, then we have the danger of losing all sense of respect. Look at verses 3 and 4. So they brought these gold cups taken from the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines drank from them. And while they drank from them, they praised their idols made of gold, silver, bronze, wood, and stone. So they're drinking from God's flatware, his stemware, and then they're praising other gods who people made. So they're really not gods. And there you see the crumbling culture in Babylon. Nothing was sacred to them anymore. They had abandoned all absolutes. There were no more restraints. And there's no respect for anything that is sacred. It was party time in Babylon. And then an amazing thing happens. Look at verse 5. Suddenly, they saw the fingers of a human hand writing on the plaster wall of the king's palace near the lampstand. This is where we get the idiom, the writing is on the wall. The king himself saw the hand as it wrote, and his face turned pale with fright. His knees knocked together in fear, and his legs gave way beneath him. And the king shouted for the enchanters, the astrologers, and the fortune tellers to be brought before him. He said to these wise men of Babylon, Whoever can read this writing and tell me what it means is going to be dressed in purple robes of royal honor and will have a gold chain placed around his neck, and he will become the third highest ruler in the kingdom. And the queen says, There's a guy. He was around when Nebuchadnezzar was around. 
And he would answer. When Nebuchadnezzar would have a dream, he would go to him and he'd tell him the right answer. So into the party hall comes Daniel. Now, you need to understand, Daniel was not at the party. When people, most people don't want the man of God around when the liquor's flowing and the women are present. But when the writing is on the wall, when the crisis comes, they no longer want their immoral friends and their drinking buddies. They're looking for somebody who can tell them what it means. And Daniel looks around, and the shouting, and the drinking, and the sex has come to a stop. And a strange silence fills the banquet hall, and people looked as if they were frozen in time. The sacred vessels were scattered around the tables. Daniel is the only person in the room, I think, that is calm. And then he did what every preacher should do. He took God's word, and without fear or favor, simply reveals to them what God says. Listen to Daniel as he stands before him. Before he interpreted the handwriting on the wall, he preached a sermon with three points. I don't know if he had a poem at the end or not, but he had three points. The first was word about power. Daniel reminded Belshazzar that King Nebuchadnezzar's power came from God. In fact, if you go back and read the previous chapter when Nebuchadnezzar was bragging about what he'd done and God humbled him, God makes him insane. He gets cast out from society. He eats grass. It reminds me of my dog that will go out and sit and eat grass. Except that's your king out there sitting and eating grass. If that's not crazy, God humbled him for seven years. Seven years. (laughs) And when God restores his sanity to him, the first thing out of his mouth is, God knows how to humble people. Nebuchadnezzar learned where power came from. It came from God. Then Daniel says, second, here's a word about pride. And he reminds the king that Nebuchadnezzar lost his kingdom because of that pride. And then third, there's a word about punishment. Nebuchadnezzar was punished until he came to learn that the most high rules over the kingdoms of the world. And he gives them to anyone he chooses. Then Daniel applies the text. You knew all this, but you have not humbled yourself. King Belshazzar, you knew about the power, you knew about the pride, you knew about the punishment, but sadly, you have lost all sense of remembrance, all sense of reality, all sense of restraint, all sense of respect. When we forget these things, we become blind to the fact, just like Babylon, that our problems are not primarily political, economic, or social. The decline of any nation stems from spiritual factors. Everything else is just symptomatic. Back to the banquet. The hall is silent. Daniel now reveals the handwriting on the wall. Mene, mene, tekel, parson, he says. Verse 26 says, this is what these words mean. Mene means numbered. God has numbered the days of your reign and has brought it to an end. Tekel means weighed. You have been weighed on the balances and have not measured up. Parson means divided. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. These words reveal the same three elements involved in the sinner's destruction. Numbered, weighed, and separated. God's judgment is certain. There's not a wall high enough or thick enough to prevent a person or a nation from falling when God writes mene, mene, tekel, parson. Who knows how close we might be to having our number called? Who knows how close we might be to facing God's judgment. One thing we know for sure is which side we'll be on when he separates the sheep from the goats. Well, now the ballroom scene is one of fright and terror. But there was one person who stood peacefully. He wasn't scared. He wasn't concerned about his destiny because he knew the one who had written on the wall. Daniel was all right. And the fifth chapter of Daniel concludes with these words, That very night, Belshazzar was slain, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom. His days were numbered quite shortly, weren't they? 
that very night. While Babylon had partied with no sense of remembrance, reality, restraint, or respect, the armies of the Medes and the Persians diverted the Euphrates into a swampland, and they marched right into the city on the dry riverbed that ran under the city walls. And they took the city. The freedoms of America cannot be maintained apart from a people and laws that follow the principles set down by God. The God of the universe. Now, you may think, that's my opinion, and it is, but it's not only mine. Great men from our history would agree. John Adams said this, our second president stated it well in an address to the military on October 11th, 1798. He said, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Alex de Tocqueville is a French philosopher who came to America and he was, his purpose in coming was to see what made America so great in the 1830s. And he's credited with saying this, I sought for the key to the greatness and the genius of America in her harbors, in her fertile fields and boundless forests, in her rich mines and vast world commerce, in her public school system and institutions of learning. I sought for her, sought, sought for it in her Democrat Congress and her matchless constitution. Not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits flame with righteousness, did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because America is good, and if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. 1830. It's important that Christians remember that our foundation to remember our foundation and continue to live to the glory of God and to be an example of godly living to those who live in this great nation. It's important to invite others to come to Christ because it's only in relationship with the living God, the only God, that we are going to seek to be good. The blessings that God has poured out on our nation because our nation has lived and existed on principles he established in his word, have made this a nation worth fighting for and worth dying for. So on Memorial Day, let's not remember those who have fought and died for the freedoms we have in this country. But let's remember those. Did I say not remember those? Sorry. Let's remember those. I was mixing up lines here. Let's remember those who have fought and died for the freedoms we have in this country. But let us also remember that the freedoms we have in this country are not possible apart from Christ's work in the lives of many of our founders and the defenders of this nation. Without Christ's sacrifice on the cross and his work to reconcile men with God, there would be no true liberty. It's only because of Christ's sacrifice that we can have the Holy Spirit of God indwell us so that we are free to live godly lives. So we need to remember for the sake of our future. On this Memorial Day weekend, let's remember the men and the women who have died and fought for our nation. And as we do so, let us also remember in another memorial the work that Jesus has done in making salvation and righteous living possible through his sacrifice upon the cross. There's a last night for every nation. There's a last night for every individual. And in light of eternity, what is the kingdom of Babylon or any other nation compared to the kingdom that is forfeited by men and women without Christ? Our days are indeed numbered. We need to have a sense of urgency in exchanging our own righteousness for the righteousness of Christ through the new birth that's only offered through salvation. I love this country. I worry for our country. And I got to tell you, the older I get and the more I watch, the more I understand what Peter and different ones wrote about us being citizens of heaven. And I'm an American, but I'm a Christian first. And we are called to follow God. 
And God will honor that. And you can try to rewrite our history and make it something other than what it is. But if you go to the Mayflower Compact, if you go back to the original documents of groups coming in, they came looking for religious freedom. I know there are plenty that came with other motives, but the documents tell us what their intent was. Their methods may not have always been right, but they were looking for a place where they could worship God freely or not worship God freely. That's important. Our freedom is so important. Our religious freedom is so important. Not so that we can exist as a church, but so that the gospel can be shared without forcing people to do it. A state-sponsored church is wrong. You can't force people's heart to do anything. When church and government get in bed together, it's horrible. We also don't want the government to say that we cannot share the gospel. We have good news. It's the power of Christ. It's foolishness to those who aren't being saved, but we know it's the power of Christ, right? And so our liberties are important because they allow us to share that. They allow us to put it out in the public um, spectrum of debate. And you're free then to accept it or reject it on its own merit without government interference. That freedom is important. I have to tell you, I dread sermons on days like these because I do not feel like the church should be a political entity. That's not to say that we shouldn't participate in the political stuff, but Jesus didn't preach politics. Jesus preached truth. So we'll preach truth, and it'll have an impact on politics. But I will not stand up here and endorse a party. I will not endorse the process. I will not endorse a person except for Jesus. And Jesus is what our country needs. And without Christ and without people who are sold out and following him, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. Because we have lost a sense of remembrance. Because we have no restraint. Without Christ, there is no reality. So let's pray.